Okay, this last panel um, will be about uh, techniques, future techniques for understanding exoplanets, how to achieve those techniques. My name is Johanna Teske. Um, I'm a postdoc at Carnegie Observatories, and I'll be moderating. Um, you can start posting questions to the, um, the app right now, but first we're gonna let our panelists introduce themselves um, and their ideas about future techniques. Cool, okay. So, so first is Jen Burke. Yeah, I'm going first. I'm gonna copy the idea of standing because it's been a long five days of sitting. <laughs> um, so yeah, while the slides get pulled up, my name is Jennifer Burt. I'm currently a Torres postdoctoral fellow here at MIT, and I spend my time thinking about ground-based radio velocity mass measurements of exoplanets. Oh yeah, and so as this first video shows the, oh, and it's not gonna loop. Well, in case you missed it, <laughs> um, that first video was supposed to show the way radial velocity observations work, or how the science works, really, which is that if you have a planet, there we go, yay, uh, orbiting around the star, then the planet induces a gravitational pull on the center of the star, which causes the star to do a little hula hoop motion in the center. And that hula hoop motion shows up in spectra, this rainbow, um, as a shift in the star's absorption lines, these little black lines that serve as kind of a chemical fingerprint for the star. And so if you observe a star over weeks or months or years, and there's a planet orbiting around it, then you'll see these lines shift back and forth. And what we can do with that is measure those line shifts. So here are those same absorption lines, but shown on an actual spectrograph. And be, uh, based on the motion of the shift, you can plot how fast the star is moving towards or away from you in the radial direction, hence it being a radial velocity. Uh, and so the bigger the shift, the more the star is moving. And if you know how massive the star is, you can then work out how massive the planet orbiting around it is and the period that it takes for that planet to orbit around the star. And so when doing radial velocity observations, you get mostly these two uh, main planet criteria, which are the mass of the planet and its period or its distance from the star. So I wanted to give you a sense of the, how challenging this can be because when you see a beautiful sine curve like the one I showed a moment ago, it seems quite simple to measure the amplitude and period of that. Uh, but so this is a picture of, I believe this is the, the engineering grading for the Espresso spectrograph that is now in operation on the VLT. Uh, that is a CCD that is 9,000 pixels across. And if you're trying to do radial velocity science, we're looking for these lines to shift in very, very small increments, okay? So a shift of one pixel gets you something like a kilometer per second in radial velocity. And with a kilometer per second precision, you can measure things like binary stars going around one another or maybe some hot Jupiters. Uh, and so this is the binary star HIP 67620. And you can see that the velocity of the star over time is something like six kilometers per second. Okay. Now we can do better than that nowadays. We passed the kilometer per second mark quite a while ago, which is good for us. Um, if you can get down to measuring things on the one one thousandth of a pixel scale, which is actually a thing we do pretty regularly nowadays, you can start measuring planets more like uh, small Earth up to like Neptune-sized things. So these are results that actually were shown earlier in the conference this week. This is Gliese uh, 357 that was presented by Henri Paillet on behalf of his grad student, Rafa. And here you can see that we have radial velocities on kind of the two meter per second level. So this is two one-thousandths of a pixel that we're able to detect these shifts. And so to kind of look at what we've done to date, here is another iteration of the plot that we've seen many times. Uh, these are the known exoplanets. And here I've plotted the period and days on the x-axis and the mass of the planets on the y-axis. And then the size of their RV variations is shown in this color bar here. And so unsurprisingly, big planets, very massive planets on very short, like one day periods, have very big signals because they pull very hard on their stars. So these things have signals of hundreds of meters per second. Uh, but you can see that at the moment, you know, we're getting down to kind of this like dark blue to, to middling purple color, which means that most of our detections are in fact at the one meter per second level. And we haven't had a ton of success yet at getting below that. So that, in part, is keeping us from finding other solar systems like our own. And this question came up in the last panel. I thought it was a really nice one to kind of latch onto for this conversation. So if we are looking for an, an, an analog to our own solar system elsewhere in the galaxy, what's stopping us from finding that? Because as you heard earlier, we don't have one yet. When we look out at the other stars and their planets, we see systems that look nothing like us. And so is that a statistical fact that we are rare, or is that an observational bias that's imparted by which stars we look at and how we look at them? 
So there are three things in my mind that are preventing us from being able to find ourselves out among the stars. And I'm gonna go through them very quickly and then hopefully people will have questions about how we can help mitigate these in the coming decades and we can talk about that during the discussion. Uh, so the first is our observational baseline. So this plot shows the number of planets that we've detected as a function of year. So it's a cumulative distribution. You can see that nowadays we're up at about the 4,000 exoplanet mark, which is pretty good. Hmm? Um, and so one of the issues is that the field of radial velocity detection started in about the mid-90s, which means that at this point in time, we could roughly see Jupiter going around its star maybe twice. Okay, Jupiter takes about 11 years to go around the sun. And so this is the period of Jupiter shown if we had started observing it right in the mid-90s, and it would finish its cycle, finish one nice sine curve uh, in about 2007. And so that's okay. We could, we could see Jupiter. There are indeed a few what we call Jupiter analogs in the literature nowadays. Uh, but if you move outwards in our outer solar system to something more like Saturn, well, now we can't actually catch a full cycle. Okay, if we had started observing a star that had a Saturn analog back in the mid-90s, we still would not have seen it finish a full period around its star. Uh, and as you might guess, this problem only gets worse, right? Like if you try to look for net or Uranus, I think the end of it is somewhere by the pipe organ. <laughs> so we're, we, we wouldn't actually be able to see a full sine curve of any of these planets, and that's problematic because the way that we tend to look for planetary signatures is by using lone scargill periodograms or other uh, Fourier techniques that really hone in on the presence of sine curves in your data. Uh, the next issue is RV precision. So the, the observational baseline addresses the lack of seeing equivalents to our ice giants and, and gas giants in the outer parts of our solar system. If we're instead trying to look for equivalents to the terrestrial planets in the inner part of our solar system, we're limited mostly by the precision of our instruments. So I mentioned before that we can now routinely get to about a meter per second. Uh, which is great for finding kind of super-Earth and sub-Neptune planets on short period orbits. But if you want to find us, if we are looking for the Earth around another star like the Sun, then that signal, oop, I broke it. Yeah, there we go, is more like nine centimeters a second. And so if you take one of those CCDs that I showed earlier and you zoom in to the point where you're no longer looking at the individual pixels, but rather at the actual silicon lattice that underlays the CCD that what we're using to measure uh, the spectra, the size of a nine centimeter shift is something like four and a half silicon atoms. Okay, so this is a measurement that no one in the world uh, of, of radio velocity is able to make just yet, but this is what we're striving for. And so this level of detection of being able to measure something that's literally atoms across is going to require a whole new regime of stability uh, in both temperature, pressure, and how we're measuring the lines. So RV precision, other big challenge. Um, and on top of that, even if we do develop the capability to measure things at the nine to 10 centimeter per second regime, which is shown here, so here's uh, radial velocity, and here's our tiny little nine centimeter per second sine curve, that's gonna be dwarfed by the activity of the star itself. So the planet induces this nice nine centimeter per second signal, but during that same time period, the star is undergoing all sorts of activity. And so this is data taken um, from the sun using the Harps North uh, spectrograph. And so this is the activity level of the sun due to spots and flares and all sorts of different pulsations, oscillations, granulation effects. And you can see that the signal of the earth is just absolutely swamped uh, when comparing the amplitude of these two things. And so if we get to the point where our instruments can handle looking for a signal of this size, then we still need to find a way to mitigate what the stars themselves are doing. So I view these three things, observational baseline, RV precision, and new techniques to understand and model out what the stars are doing as the things that we need to be able to progress forward and start looking for ourselves elsewhere in the galaxy. And so hopefully during the Q&A, we can talk about some of the ways to try and solve those problems. Okay. Can I get to my slides? I think they need to pull it up. Okay, in the meantime, I wanna ask, how many of you have used an adaptive optic system in your observational life? Raise your hand. Okay, <clears throat> keep your hand up if you've used a coronagraph as well with that AO system. <laughs> okay, a few people. Um, so my name is Becky jensen Clem. I'm a Miller Fellow at Berkeley, and in a few months I'll be starting an assistant faculty position at UC Santa Cruz. And I'd like to give you a quick orientation about exoplanet imaging so you can understand what the state of the art is now and where we might be going a few decades into the future. 
So those of us in high contrast imaging love to show this picture of HR8799 because it makes us look really successful. <laughs> um, when in fact, this is the only system for which we've directly imaged multiple planets. And we've really only imaged, depending on how you count, between a dozen and two dozen planets in total. And you can see some of those on the upper right hand side of that figure. So clearly, we need to push closer into the stars so we can better overlap with the radial velocity regime. And we want to push to fainter planets so that we can overlap with planets like Jupiter and Saturn in our own solar system. So I want to explain to you why it's so difficult to directly image planets. Why aren't we farther than we are today? Um, so we can think of the light being emitted by the star. It's light like any other light, and so it has an amplitude and it has a phase. We call the surfaces of constant phase in that starlight wave fronts. And it's wave fronts that we try to control in an adaptive optics system. So these wave fronts start out circular because the star is emitting light in all directions. But by the time they reach us on the Earth, they're so stretched out that they look pretty much flat. So if we bring these wave fronts to a focus, we form an image of the star, and that's the familiar airy disk pattern. And so, of course, the star has the extent of lambda over d at its core, where for us, d is the diameter of our telescope. But what if your faint exoplanet falls right on one of those first airy rings? You still won't be able to see it because of the star's shot noise. And so that's why we have coronagraphs. The job of a coronagraph is to suppress the airy rings of the star. But what if we can't see the star's airy rings in the first place? This happens in particular for ground-based telescopes because as the wavefronts encounter pockets of air in the Earth's atmosphere that have, say, different temperatures, those wavefronts become what we call aberrated, or their shape has become distorted. And those distortions change on millisecond timescales as the atmosphere evolves. Uh, and unfortunately, you don't get a free lunch when it comes to wavefront control if you're in space. Uh, there are optical imperfections in all of your mirrors and lenses in a space-based telescope, and things like pointing jitter and thermal variations in a space-based telescope uh, still require you to control the shape of these wavefronts. And we do that using adaptive optics systems. We use a special mirror called a deformable mirror that may have hundreds or thousands of actuators to control the shape of that mirror. And the deformable mirror uh, flattens out the shape of our wavefront. We know how to change the shape of our deformable mirror using something called a wavefront sensor, which I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A session. And after the AO system, we put in our coronagraph optics to suppress the airy rings to then form our image of the star. Most of the starlight has now been suppressed so we can image a planet uh, behind the star. OK, so how are we doing? I said that we've only imaged about a dozen to two dozen planets. Um, and in the upper right, you can see some performance curves in terms of the contrast, how much fainter is the planet from the star that we can detect versus the separation. Um, and you see some curves from modern instruments like GPI and Sphere, and also a JWST predicted curve there. So the space-based telescopes of the future, which are shown in blue here, can reach much, much deeper contrast because they don't have to handle the atmosphere of the Earth. But the giant segmented mirror telescopes, the GSMTs, like the GMT, the TMT, the ELT, they can reach into much closer to the stars because they're simply so much bigger. So this is a size comparison of some of our uh, current and planned space-based telescopes versus our next generation of ground-based telescopes. And so these ground-based telescopes are really monsters in comparison to anything we plan to put in space anytime soon. And why are there two different lines showing these GSMT performance estimates? Well, the top line is showing what we would get if we simply took an existing system like GPI and we simply put it on a bigger telescope. Whereas that bottom line is showing the performance we think we could reach if we implemented some of the adaptive upgra optics upgrades we currently have planned today. And this makes a huge difference. These different uh, colored points here uh, are potential planets um, drawn from a distribution of a possible planet population. And the planets in green are habitable zone rocky planets. We would see none of those if we put today's AO systems on a larger telescope. We could see several or many of those with the planned AO upgrades. So these are some of the instruments that are planned to go on the next generation of ground-based telescopes to do high contrast imaging. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about any of these, including PSI, a second generation instrument for the TMT that will do high contrast imaging. Another that I'm particularly excited about is METIS. METIS is one of the first light instruments on the European Extremely Large Telescope. It'll do mid-infrared imaging uh, at high contrast. 
Um, and we've heard a few times that we need to go to space to see planets, rocky planets in the habitable zones of sun-like stars. Um, we can achieve that goal on the ground, but only at longer wavelengths. So METIS aims to, at 10 microns, observe the thermal emission of true Earth analogs, and that's something that I'm very excited to see. Um, so there is a sense in which uh, lambda over d does not always reign supreme, um, and that is using, for example, an external coronagraph called a starshade. Uh, a starshade could potentially rendezvous with a future space telescope, such as w first shown here. And now, instead of the inner working angle of the coronagraph being given by lambda over d, it now has to do with the size of the starshade and the separation between the telescope and the starshade. And so that's a very exciting avenue for us to pursue in the future. And looking out even farther, perhaps telescopes will look very different 50 years from now than they look today. Maybe we could use the sun as a telescope uh, and allow it to be a gravitational lens and allow us to, say, get 1,000 pixels across in an image of a planet around a nearby star. So I want to encourage all of you to think about and ask us questions about telescopes that may look radically different from anything that we see now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jesse. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jesse Christensen. I'm a research scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute. Uh, when Chris Martin, who organized today, asked us to think far into the future, I actually couldn't think of that much interesting to say about my normal areas of expertise. So you'll forgive me if I got a little bit excited about an area that's a step out of what I normally do. I'm not an expert, but the room is full of experts, so I plan to throw to them during the question session if I need help. High resolution spectroscopy in space. Uh, I think this is going to be really exciting. Uh, so that's why I decided to let my imagination run a little bit wild with this. And I want to thank the people from whom I've been bugging all week for help and grabbing resources from. OK, so what are the science cases for high resolution spectroscopy of exoplanets? So we've talked about radio velocity, which is looking at the star moving. So with high resolution spectroscopy, you can disentangle from the spectrum the planet moving back and forth. Uh, why is this cool? This is cool because it doesn't require transits. I'm like waiting for someone to come up and grab my transiting planet card off me right now. We don't need transits. You don't actually need transits to characterize the atmosphere of a planet. It was a shock to me too. Uh, but that's really exciting because it really opens up the number of planets that are nearby to us where we can characterize the planet atmosphere. All right. Why is this? There we go. There's two green buttons. Uh, why is this exciting? Uh, so the higher resolution you have, uh, the more you can separate lines. So some lines we see today are actually combinations of lines. If you have higher resolution, you can separate them out. Each molecule and atom has its own spectral fingerprint, and the higher resolution you have, the better detection you have of which molecule, molecules, and atmosphere, molecules and atoms are in your atmosphere. Someone earlier today asked for precise abundance measurements. I've highlighted in green through my talk the things that specific panel members said this morning that they wanted in the future. So this is something you can do with high-resolution spectroscopy, get better abundance measurements. For widely separated planets, uh, you can actually put your high-resolution spectrograph behind a high-contrast imager, like Becky was just talking about, and do spectroscopy on the planet that way. Separate the light, do the spectroscopy like that. Uh, and finally, a uh, very cool science case, uh, which has been done for a while now, but I'm excited by it, finally. I got on the, I got on the bandwagon. Uh, the shape of the, of the lines in the, in the spectrum tells you something about the surface of the planet. You can see, you can see winds, you can see surface features uh, if you have this high-resolution spectroscopy. So I think this is really exciting. Okay. So in the future, how do we do better? How do we get more, better results on more interesting planets? OK, in order to get better high-resolution spectroscopy, you need to maximize your resolution, how fine you are looking at your lines. Uh, the collecting area, bigger telescope, more photons, better signal to noise. Throughput, so thank you to Jacob Bean, who I'm not sure if he's still here, but for giving me an exquisite walkthrough on why throughput was important. Uh, and simultaneous wavelength coverage. So this is important both because of that spectral fingerprint I was talking about. If you get more wavelength coverage, you have a better, set, better ability to pull out which atoms and molecules it is, but also uh, to disentangle from stellar activity. So stellar activity, uh, uh, having the wider leverage arm over the wavelength coverage lets you disentangle the planet signal better. What do you want to minimize in order to build a better high-resolution spectrograph? Uh, thermal, pressure, thermal and pressure changes, anything that's changing the focal length of the path of your instrument. Uh, tellurics, this is something that the people on stage have had to deal with a lot. Uh, my telescopes are already in space, so I'm already above all of this. 
Uh, and then stellar activity. Uh, you can't actually go out and turn off the sun or the stars, uh, so we need to model it better, like Jen was saying. Okay, the near-term plans for high-resolution spectra. I'm gonna start near us and get, just get wilder and wilder as I step out in my slides. Okay, so at the moment, we have instruments, high-resolution instruments that have these exoplanet science cases. Uh, a bunch of these are, I think these are all built and most of them are commissioning or about to be commissioned, uh, all built right now. In the future, we have the next generation of ELTs, which we were just talking about, uh, and, and each of those has a high-resolution spectrograph. Interestingly, the European Extremely Large Telescope has a mid-infrared one, the GMT has an optical one, and the TMT has a near-infrared one. So I thought that was really interesting, that each of the large telescopes kind of went in a different direction with their, with their science case for their high-resolution imager. Uh, but they'll be able to do really, really exquisite things uh, with high-resolution spectro high spectrographs on exoplanet atmospheres. Okay, this I had to include because <laughs> I just found it. Uh, this is um, this is the GCLEF instrument uh, with Mercedes and Dave Charbonneau and Elizabeth Newton for scale, <laughs> all of whom were here at some point, and I don't know if any of them are here now, uh, but they are here to scale. Oh, Mercedes is here. So that's what they look like to scale with this next generation of instruments. Okay. So that's, current, that's kind of either built or, you know, isn't just a piece of paper somewhere. There's someone in a lab building something. So let's go, let's take another step. In space. <laughs> All right, so how do we take these high-resolution spectrographs to space? Okay, why would we go to space to start with? Okay, so you get above the telluric lines, that's great. Uh, Becky pointed out that doesn't solve all your problems, but it helps a lot. Uh, getting above the atmosphere also gives you access to more of this wavelength range, which I explained why it's important to get as much wavelength coverage as possible. Uh, you can get these high cadence continuous observations. One of the things that was mentioned earlier today as being important is just being able to con observe continuously as much as possible. Uh, that does a few things. Um, so if you're trying to observe a planet and you don't perhaps exactly know its period, if you're observing continuously, you're able to secure its period much easier and you're not getting fooled by aliases. Uh, and also, it gives you a better handle on the stellar activity. If you're trying to simultaneously model the stellar activity and the planet spectrum, continuous observations let you, lets you do that uh, much better. Another thing that was asked for, stable temperature and pressure. If you go to an orbit that's far away from the Earth, it's, it's usually pretty stable out there, which is nice. Disadvantages of going to space. So why aren't we there right now? It sounds great, right? Uh, high resolution spectrographs are heavy. Uh, There's not like a 10 centimeter camera like test that you just throw on a, on a Falcon 9 and it's up there. They're heavy. Um, so this is one of the things we're going to have to deal with in the future. Either making them smaller or getting, spending more money. Space is expensive, getting to money. Uh, it's uh, not cheap to send things to space. Uh, and typically, a disadvantage of space is once it's up there, it's up there. Uh, we're having this problem right now. Uh, sometimes you can't go and fix them, especially if you have no shuttle. Uh, so that's a disadvantage of space. But there are some ideas for how we can do this. Um, so this is the Earthfinder concept. So Peter Plavchan's up the back, uh, kindly gave me the uh, Earthfinder concept report for this. So this is a UV to infrared uh, telescope, one and a half meters, with a resolution of 120,000. Uh, so that's a that's a, a fairly well rounded concept at this point. Uh, Becky spoke about this, but I'll bring this up again. So uh, the star shade and W first is another way we might be able to do this. I have a question mark, because I wasn't actually able to find anything about the resolution that you might be able to get with this. So if anybody knows, tell me in the question and answer session. Thank you. Okay, another one that I found as a future space-based mission that has a high resolution spectrograph on it is the Eclipse A instrument on the Louvois concept. So that's again a UV to infrared instrument um, either A or B, uh, with a resolution of 70,000 in the near infrared. So these are just some of the ideas for high resolution spectrographs in space. Okay, so this is the last slide. So now we can go really far. Let's just let our imaginations run wild. What else can we do if we're thinking about 30 years from now and Becky's inviting us to think about telescopes that look different? So let's talk about all of the stuff that we could do to make this even better. Uh, Two green buttons. Telescope assembly in space. Once you get to a telescope of a certain size, it just makes more sense to launch it in pieces and assemble it in space. That's a really cool idea, but we're not there yet. Interferometry. This is something that's been an idea that's been around for a while, uh, but launching uh, an interferometer into space would really give us access uh, to a resolution that at the moment isn't possible. 
uh, fleets of spacecraft. So we heard earlier in the week about you know, this test network, uh, so multiple testers. Uh, I was talking to Jane Berkby. Her vision is multiple high reses on spacecraft, just observing all of the nearby stars continuously. So fleets of spacecraft solve a lot of problems. They're expensive. Uh, so this is one that Becky mentioned, uh, using the sun as a gravitational lens. You have to go to 550 AU to do that. So just on last night's Astrobe H, if anybody saw it, conveniently timed for this presentation, David Kipping had a paper about using the Earth, uh, not as a gravitational lens, but as a, refraction, a refracting lens. Uh, so you don't have to go to 550 AU. You only have to go as far as the, as the moon uh, in order to use the Earth as that kind of lens. So that's a cool idea. And then we heard this morning, I couldn't make it green because I wanted it to stand out, but putting a radio antenna on the far side of the moon keeps coming up or in space. Uh, the one thing I didn't have time to talk about is uh, technology gaps. So these are really cool ideas. You would be able to achieve so much science with these. But there's important, you know, hard technological things we need to do to get there. Uh, so the Exoplanet Exploration Program at JPL has a technology gap list where they've tried to identify what are the actual missing technologies we need to get to some things like this? Uh, so if there are questions about that, we can talk about the technology gap list. OK, so now we can start. OK. Thank you to all the panelists for giving us very informative introductions. Uh, and now we can switch to the questions. Excellent. Uh, so the question oh, that's at the top right now if I do. I can't see. You're going to have to read it out to me. Yes, yes, I will. I'm so will. old. Okay, great. I can't read either of these um, screens. So the question is, can you elaborate on using the sun as a telescope, and what would it take to make that happen? So maybe, Becky, you can start. Yeah, so um, there's currently a study being done, I believe, jointly by JPL and the Aerospace Corporation to try to understand this idea better. There are some publications on this idea out there as well, if you search for sun as a gravitational lens. Uh, but as Jesse said, you have to go all the way out to about 550 AU. Uh, you have to know where the planet is um, beforehand, so we would have to have identified it ahead of time. Um, the focal surface of the sun as a gravitational lens is something like a kilometer square. Uh, so you couldn't have just one telescope sample that whole focal surface. So you can imagine sending, for example, a fleet of small telescopes out, which would then sample that full spatial field. Um, one challenge is that so far, when you're so far away, um, you have to be able to send a lot of data back um, as you're flying through that, that focal point. So that kind of communication challenge is there. Um, also, you can't slow down, really, once you've gotten to 550 AU. So this might be more of a one-shot exercise as we move through that area. So there are many technical <laughs> challenges, um, but I haven't yet heard a better idea for getting hundreds of pixels across another planet. So I'm, I'm interested in pursuing it. Anything else? What about Jesse? Do you have any comments on the sun as a telescope, Earth as a telescope? I mean, just in case they were wondering, it's the, the physics is like microlensing. So the gravity of the sun is bending the light from the background star and planet, and then you basically block out the sun, uh, block out the sun and then you're getting the light and the planet in the background. It's like microlensing. I had to look that up because it's different from David Kipping's idea. Right. So the Earth isn't a microlensing gravitational lens at that point. It's reflecting. We were having this conversation before. Right. If anyone out there uh, knows optics in the context of general relativity, uh, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, so the next question, um, I should also say who this, those I think are both from. The first one was anonymous. This is also anonymous. Um, out of all the instruments that were proposed by other people today, um, uh, which one do you think is most feasible within the next 30 years? Feasible? Ooh, <laughs> I like it. Um, OK. So, I so guess something that that's not already being built. And fight like cost wise. Yeah. I would say um, Starshade and WFIRST as something that hasn't been built yet, but is feasible mm -hmm. uh, in 30 years. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's feasible and would be a super good demonstration of a whole bunch of technology we don't have yet. So formation, flying, and sensing, uh, stability, shape stability. There's a whole bunch of uh, technology that we need to get, we need to tick off to get to that point, but I think that's feasible in 30 years. 
Do you know, because I always forget what the right number is, but the alignment of W first and starshade has to be good to within like, what to me always seemed like a ridiculously small number for flying two things in space independently of one another. Yeah, they have to be in the tens of thousands of kilometers apart, and then I don't re remember exactly what the, does anybody in the audience I, remember exactly what the precision it needs to be at? Like the I position tens of meters? Yeah, so it's meters, like, meters, which is just blows my mind that that is, I, I hope that is a thing we can do, but it seems like a, a crazy amount of precision to, to ask for. So I also think that it'll be possible on that time scale to directly image uh, rocky, habitable zone planets. I think it's within our power to do that both around M dwarfs using ground-based telescopes and around G dwarfs using space-based telescopes. Um, and that's something that we're all, Many of us are actively developing the wavefront control technology to do, um, but there are no showstoppers for doing that in the coming decades. Um, I wanted to highlight another question um, from Natalia. Can you talk about the technology gap list that you oh, brought up? Sure. So I just alluded to it a little bit with the um, W first and Starshade, but so for all of these things, uh, these the ground-based instruments where we're trying to get better coronagraphs and the space-based instruments, uh, there's this uh, document. It, you can look for it online. It's a public document that the Exoplanet Exploration Program has put together, uh, which basically goes through step by step in order to achieve the science that we need to do. What are the missing steps? What are the steps we have to go through? Uh, the boxes we have to check. Um, so we don't have your cheat sheet up on stage, I don't think, uh, but it's, um, so it's formation flying and sensing, uh, it's wavefront control, uh, it's contrast and contrast stability for, di for uh, direct imaging, so it's not just getting the 10 to the minus nine or 10 to the minus 10, but holding it. Um, it's shape stability for star shades. Uh, do you remember any of the others? Uh, so questions when it comes to high contrast imaging, like. Uh, throughput um, and mm -hmm. bandwidth are also very important. Too. Mm -hmm. But this is a publicly available yes. document. And it's yes. really fascinating reading. Uh, I, would, I would tell people to go and look at it. And I think there's also a science gap list. There is a science gap list. I don't know if that one's public. OK. Uh, but yeah, I, this is something that is, um, we're looking for, I think, community input on the, the gaps in our knowledge and technology. Uh, OK, so let's see, we did that one. So the next question. It's kind of more for Jen. Uh, is there a hard limit on RV precision? Can we go subatomic? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say one atom. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to say it might be something like one atom. I mean, to some extent, if you have enough measurements, you would expect them to form a distribution around the right answer. And so I imagine it. it the, the limits are set more by like the amount of time you are willing to dedicate to that measurement mm -hmm. as opposed to something fundamental about your detector. Mm -hmm. um, the question of precise versus accurate is also an important one. And so right. you know, making sure that everything in your lab environment and your <laughs> telescope is controlled well enough that you really believe that you're getting a reproducible measurement each time um, plays into it a lot. Mm -hmm. So is, yeah, go ahead. Is there any thought to using something else as a sensor besides like a silicon wafer? Like if we're talking about thinking into the far future, is, it, is there any development going into other kinds of sensors? So certainly as people are thinking about moving radial velocities, and this is already starting to happen into the like near-infrared uh, wavelengths, then people are using these uh, Mercatel detectors mm -hmm. instead. And so those So how'd they get those atoms? <laughs> I, I don't know. I should look that up, actually. <laughs> those instruments thus far are not quite as precise as what we've done in the visible, um, likely okay. because we haven't been doing it for 25 years, and so they're kind of still being developed and, and coming online. So we're getting you know, one to a few meter per second precision on a lot of those instruments, like the habitable planet finder that's on the ATT, um, and Spiru and IRD are coming up, uh, being commissioned right now, or maybe have started operations at this point. So, so if, if you could go to space, would it be better to go to UV, like, because the wavelength is smaller? Could you get higher precision if you went to the UV? I, I would worry that we don't know... It would depend on what the line density looks like. So normally the redder wavelengths, the, the redder side of the visible spectrum, you have a higher concentration of narrow absorption lines, which mm. is what you're requiring. Like that's what you're actually measuring the shift in. And so I don't know the distribution of lines in the UV, nor do I know how sensitive they are to stellar activity, because that's the other thing that, you know, what we do right now, um, what instruments like HARPS and Espresso do, is they look at, you know, a given band of wavelength space, and then they have a mask that they say, these are the lines that we think are well-behaved and are 
corresponding to a planet imparting a signal in the star as opposed to the star itself being active. Okay. And so I don't know that a ton of research has yet been done into the, the UV side of that, mm -hmm. um, just because it's not super accessible from the ground. Uh, and so it would be, that, that would be the first thing you'd have to look into, is like how many lines are they? Are they nice and narrow and well separated enough that you can resolve them? And then do we trust that they're moving because of a Keplerian signal and not the star itself? Right, so if you put the silicon wafer on a bigger telescope, it yeah. doesn't help you, you still have those tiny atoms. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of a, a related question that I'll jump to um, from Travis Metcalf. What new observations can help mitigate the influence of stellar activity on exoplanet detection? So I think this is already starting to happen, which is great. Um, cadence, like my big answer is cadence. We need to just be looking at the sun all of the time to understand the variety of different time scales and different amplitudes that show up because stellar activity is not just one signal, it is the star responding to a variety of things happening inside of it. Uh, and so Harps North is doing this. They have the, the sun as a star program, so they have this tiny little solar telescope that picks off light from the sun and sends it into the Harps North spectrograph. And now they've started doing this uh, with the Harps, original Harps spectrograph in the south as well. Um, NUID, which is the new uh, extreme precision RV instrument that's going on the wind telescope at Kid Peak, is planning to do this, have a little solar telescope. And so I think, you know, for a long time, we've tried to back out stellar activity signals from relatively sparse observations and taking the time to really just like all day, every day, have this little, because your, your spectrograph's not doing anything else during the day, like there are no stars to look at, so you might as well use the sun. Uh, and then taking those data sets will really help us understand at least for, you know, G one to three stars, what we think the activity is doing. Uh, how well you, how well validated it is to extrapolate that to like K stars is another matter. So, would you say we need a spectrograph in space? It, it wouldn't hurt. Like if you offer me one, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> um, it would certainly help with things like daily aliasing that we deal with right now in signals, and the fact that you do have telurics and water bands that are causing headaches, and removing large chunks of the wavelength band that would otherwise be very helpful and informative to you. So the fact that right now we just you know cut those parts out of our spectra and pretend they don't exist is a real loss in terms of the RV information content that you could otherwise get from those parts of the spectra. So yeah, going to space does save you from a lot of things. And I think part of Peter Plavchen's EarthFinder report was not just like more lines, but also the, the uh, chromaticity of the RVs, looking at how they change with color and yeah. seeing how that relates to stellar activity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so question for, for all of you. Um, most of these future ideas are about detailed follow-up of individual planets or systems. Is there a future for a survey and discovery missions fleets of Kepler's, you know, Jesse touched on this a little bit, uh, and this is from Ethan Cruz. Sure, so part of the reason why I didn't want to talk about transits and demographics 30 years from now is because at some point we'll find all the transiting planets, and that's probably going to be before 30 years from now, at least all the transiting planets near us that we would then be able to characterize. So with Kepler doing the census out to 1AU-ish, fudge, 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 uh, and then W first, having the census further out from that, um, I couldn't think of a really interesting, exciting science case for another survey in 30 years' time mm -hmm. in terms of us trying to answer, or in terms of me trying to get the answer to the things I care about. That doesn't mean that there aren't questions other people care about. Right. But I, I was really interested in the characterization. So I think that until now, we've been in a big paradigm of demographics. That's been one of the most important and interesting things we've been doing in exoplanet science since the beginning of exoplanet science. But starting perhaps now, and in particular starting 30 years from now, I think we will be in the era of detailed characterization. So I think the field will, will simply have shifted by that time. I do think over the next decade or two, at least, there's a lot of room for surveys, um, in particular because as these new instruments, especially on the RV side, come online that have you know a factor of three or five or 10 better precision, you then have to go back and look at all of the very bright nearby stars again. Like you can't actually pull out you know, the Earth signal around our nearby stars that have been looked at for decades with instruments that can do two to three meter per second precision. So as things like NUID and Espresso and Express come online, I think all of them are planning to do some level of, you know, go and look at all of the fourth magnitude stars, which is where we started uh, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. but now you need to look at them again and count on the fact that like if there are, you know, the, the 
tightly packed inner systems that Kepler predicts most stars should have that we don't see a ton of yet in radial velocities in the nearby stars. Like, they might be there, and it's just that up until now, we haven't been sensitive to them. Right. Yeah, there's definitely discovery space for the next couple of decades. Yeah. But I agree with you that 40 years out, like at some point, it is likely that we will have exhausted what, we what we're sensitive to. Yeah, doing yeah. detail. Cool. Okay, so the next question is um, also from Anonymous. How or what are we doing to prepare for the uh, 50,000 plus planets Guy is expected to discover in the next five years? So we're changing the database underneath the Exoplanet Archive. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that for a while to prepare. Uh, we're changing our tools. Um, yeah, no, it's really exciting. I mean, they're all going to be these giant planets, but that's great. More of those are going to... There's so many interesting questions about giant planets and how they form and how they migrated that Gaia will help us address by having this massive population. Uh, for me, it's more the logistics of, yeah, what do we do with 50,000? <laughs> like, we're <laughs> celebrating 4,000 planets, and Gaia's like, yeah, just wait. <laughs> I think there's a lot we can do, too, to better understand the stars that those planets will be orbiting. For example, doing spectroscopy and imaging now to see which of those have stellar companions. That'll help us better interpret the Gaia data once we have it. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I like this one. Um, also from Anonymous, how should we evaluate cost versus science outcome in deciding what future instrumentation to pursue? What do you think is a good balance? That's a really good question. Yeah. And I think it's above most of our pay grades. Okay. <laughs> we can take a stab. Yeah. Um, I mean, what you hear a lot is like a balanced portfolio, right? That you don't want to put all your money in one thing. You want to have big missions, medium-sized missions, little missions. And that translates to studies as well. You want to study big missions and study medium-sized missions and study little missions. And you need to make these technology steps. You need to prove on, prove on a test bed that something works. Build the test bed is step one, to show that it works. Build the instrument is step two. Um, so I think that seems wise to me to have a balance uh, and you know, put a little bit of money in a lot of different avenues and see which ones pan out and then funnel. Like, okay, this one's really going gangbusters. It's great, let's go there. These ones are a bit of a fizzle. Uh, but, but keep the options open is what I would say money-wise. Yeah, I think it's also important as we move forward and develop you know, things like the ELTs to think about if those ELTs mean that you know, facilities like Keck or the, you know, the Magellan, like the six to 10 meter class telescopes are slightly less oversubscribed, are there ways to take advantage of that and on you know, a relatively cheap scale retrofit them to do other sorts of science and you know, take advantage of like, oh, you have more nights available, so that opens up new types of science cases that you can study. <laughs> so you know, stay very aware of the smaller telescopes, smaller, <laughs> that we have um, as the, the you know, front of the field moves forward and make sure that they're being used efficiently and effectively to support your science goals. And we already see that today, right? Like the, the high resolution spectrographs going on the four meter telescopes. It's because now everybody's using the yeah, eight exactly. and 10 meter telescopes for other things and that'll sweep up like. Yeah, so I just want that to continue cool. and you yes. know. So I think often this question comes up in the context of building a large space telescope in the future. And sometimes people go so far as to say, well, I don't like the cost per planet of this mission. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really false dichotomy. If we're aiming to have a very high performance telescope that can, for example, image rocky planets in the habitable zones of G stars, if we spend a lot of money to accomplish that goal, that's not the only goal we're going to accomplish. There are so many other planets, maybe at wider separations or higher mass planets or younger planets that we'll also see and we'll see them better and observe them better from having built this high performance telescope. Um, so I think that we, shouldn't, we should get caught up in our science and not get too caught up in, in dollars per star. Right, well, and that, and that seems more like a sales pitch problem if you're selling your telescope on how many Earths it's going to see and you don't mention the 10,000 other things that it'll see. So kind of as a follow-up to that um, question that's a, a little bit farther down the list, what are the observational or instrumentation synergies between exoplanetary science uh, and, ooh, I just moved, uh, and other areas of astrophysics? Ooh, my and goodness, how? do we need to make friends with the heliophysicists? Yeah, okay. Because I think the challenge for a lot of us actually is dealing with the stars that these planets are orbiting around. And so from a personal like RV perspective, right now we wave our hands a little too much in saying like, you know, which lines are active or not. Um, and we, people have started now doing line by line analyses of RV data and trying to like look for correlations for each specific line. But 
as we move to higher resolution instruments where lines become deblended and you can really make out the individual ones, it will be very important to know not just are they active, but where do those lines form in the star? Because you would expect different formation depths to probe different types of activity a little bit, different you know, time scales. Um, and so having a, a real understanding of like where each line comes from and then being able to say, okay, these are the lines that I expect to you know, be problematic on this time scale versus that time scale. These are the ones that will correlate with what the star spots are doing versus what the H alpha emission is doing. Like we, we don't have that capability right now. And I imagine a lot of that knowledge might already exist, just not you know, specifically within like the exoplanet or RV community. And so finding the folks who could speak knowledgeably and help us figure out how to fine tune our software analyses now that our dominant noise source really is the star as opposed to the instruments. I think it's going to be really important moving forward. So there are many other areas of astrophysics that need uh, adaptive optics in general, in particular wide field adaptive optics. So those who study the galactic center have used adaptive optics to great effect at Keck Observatory, for example. Um, but what's special about high contrast imaging is that we need this extreme AO and at a very narrow field, you know, maybe only an arc second or a few arc seconds field of view. Um, but I think there are probably novel science cases in other fields that uh, we simply don't know about yet. A few years ago, there was some work, I think at the VLT, where they used a coronagraph in an extreme AO system to block out the center of an AGN and then see the structure of the galaxy around that. So I think even as we push the performance of something like extreme AO and coronography, we may come up with new science cases to take advantage of that. The other synergy I think we need to exploit more is between exoplanets and planetary science. So there are, there's a whole another division of NASA, which is planetary science. Um, and you know they know so much about the planets in our solar system now. Not as much as I thought, but lots. <laughs> um, and you know there are lots of people who are trying to make these connections. Like how do we simulate observations of solar system planets to mimic what an exoplanet would look like? You know How do we, could we reverse engineer what Jupiter looked like if we looked at it like this, like an exoplanet? Uh, since we have the ground truth Jupiter. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there to learn from each other and to you know, design missions that really exploit the fact that we do have lots of different types of planets in our solar system. Uh, so yeah, that's another real synergy that I think we should move, on, move forward on. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, how do you see CubeSats helping us advance in this Ooh. field? I think the ability to have a bunch of little <laughs> photometers that you can point at whatever star you want for extended periods of time would be amazing. So Asteria, which was a CubeSat that was designed uh, in part here at MIT, was exactly this. Like you, it's tiny, you send it up and it just stares at whatever star you are interested in for however many hours or days or months you want. Um, because you know, hearing all the talks over the past four days of the conference about losing transit ephemerids and how that is going to make things so much more challenging when you want to do James Webb observations in the future, you know, if you could just go and like, make sure that you catch that next transit because you have a relatively cheap spacecraft to help you do it, I think would be a huge improvement. In, in addition, I think CubeSats can be a platform for technology demonstration. So there's a mission being led out of Stanford called MDOT that is trying to demonstrate star shades uh, using the CubeSat platform. Yeah, and there's a couple of other ex uh, CubeSats that are up at the moment that are exploiting things like looking in the UV and mm -hmm. seeing like what does the UV environment look like around these, around these planets. So there's a lot of opportunity for CubeSats to contribute to exoplanet science, and I'm really excited to, NASA's getting really behind this CubeSat thing, uh, so let's see, hope to see more of that. So if you have good CubeSat ideas, propose them to NASA. Oh, and uh, one last thing to mention along those lines, platforms like CubeSats can be an excellent teaching tool as well. Um, and so for, there's a class here at MIT, and there are classes elsewhere that get undergrads involved in CubeSat development, and that can be a really transformative experience for a student to go through. All right, so the, excuse me, the next question is from Kevin Hardy Ullman. Are there, and you sort of addressed this a little bit, Jesse, but are there plans for a longer duration Kepler-like telescope to achieve Kepler's goal of finding an Earth-like transiting planet around a sun-like star? Not that NASA has. So right. Pla Plato, or Plato, I'm sure there are actual Europeans in the audience who'll correct me, um, the ESA mission uh, will go back to the Kepler field for an extended period of time, uh, which I think may help. Uh, it's not as big telescopes as Kepler was, but may help recover some of the low signal to noise things. Um, in terms of trying to help Kepler get to what Kepler was trying to get to, I know that there are efforts uh, to use Hubble to confirm some of the longer period low signal-to-noise candidates and really try to improve uh, our understanding of these 
kind of unreliable can planet candidates out there. Part of, the, part of the issue we have is we have candidates that are long period and small, but they're unreliable. Uh, something like 40 to 50 to 60% of them aren't real. And it would be great to get a better handle on what that number was. Um, so we don't need to build another Kepler. We have the way, we have the means to help Kepler, the original Kepler, get to its goal. Mm -hmm. uh, but it takes an investment of Hubble time that is not insignificant. Right. Can I follow up? Do you think there are still like potential Earth -like signals hiding in the Kepler data that could be extracted with better analysis, better software, better, you know, with yes, the existing data? for sure, for sure. There definitely are. Um, so for instance, a stu graduate student at UCLA, Jonathan Zink, who I've been working with for the last six months, uh, one of the things he showed was that uh, um, planets in multiple systems mask each other's signals. Like it's harder to find additional planets in the same system. Uh, so that's something where we definitely want to go back and say like, okay, so our detection efficiency for additional planets in the system was lower than we thought. We believe that means there are missing planets. So that's exciting. And then every time you detrend the data a different way, the low signal to noise stuff comes out. So there's definitely more to find in the Kepler data. Whether that helps us get to Ada or Earth, I don't know. But there's definitely more to find in the Kepler data. That's good news. Um, okay, next question. Will we be able to build instruments to observe some details of the surfaces of exoplanets? And if yes, when? So for that, we need a drastic improvement to our D and lambda over D. Um, and we've mentioned a few different ways of doing that, but it almost certainly won't be done with a monolithic telescope. And so we have to think creatively whether that's in terms of an optical or infrared interferometer, um, likely in space rather than on the ground to do that kind of imaging, uh, or whether we use a whole other solar system body as our telescope. Right, and then, um, so we were talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about 30 years from now, so we can be, yeah. we can be a little bit crazy big. So, so people like Ian Crossfield have like, you know, Imaged, imaged the surfaces of brown dwarfs by looking at the, the molecular lines. Um, so you can imagine if you had a very good high resolution spectrograph behind a high contrast imager in 30 years, you could do the same thing for exoplanets. You could look at the features, the spectral features come and go. Um, so you'd be deconvolving that, um, kind of like earlier this week where we saw uh, the Earth shine in the test data and you could actually deconvolve that and see continents coming and going. So you could imagine that, but with a spectroscopic phase curve, you could deconvolve and see spectra. So you could, like, you could totally go wild and imagine things like the infrared edge, like the vegetation edge coming and going. And you're like, oh, there's continents <laughs> with planet, plants on them. I can't say plants and planets in the same sentence. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I think them. approaches like, like Doppler imaging that you mentioned are also possible even in the near term. So for instance, there's a fiber injection unit that's just been installed at Keck, um, led by Dimitri Maui, where the hope is to inject planet light alone into a single mode fiber and then uh, disperse that into an R of 100 or more spectrum. Um, and so that followed by opportunities at 30 meter class telescopes and then in the future with something like LUVAR do provide interesting opportunities for Doppler imaging like approaches. Okay, so next question, and I'm gonna add something to it. So from Anonymous, <laughs> what aspects of future technology development and exoplanet science do you most want to see addressed in the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey? And I will also ask what you think should be addressed in the Astro 2030 or Astro 2040 Decadal Survey, like thinking even farther into the future. But you can start with 2020. Sure. So in the 2020 Decadal Survey, I'd like to see a lot of investment in, a lot of recommendation for investment in these technologies. Like to get 30 years, you know, the best time to build a coronagraph is 30 years ago. The second best time is today. Mm -hmm. Like I would like to see the recommendation that we start on this technology that we know we need for these big blue sky ideas. Like that would be really great. Even if it's just seed level funding for a bunch of these different concepts, like pushing them forward. I would like to see that. I also want to add to that that continuing to invest in our infrastructure, and in my mind, that infrastructure is the 30 meter class telescopes, the GMT and the TMT. Um, I think those telescopes are really needed, not only for all areas of astrophysics to move forward in the next several decades, but in particular for exoplanet science. Um, in addition to things like high contrast imaging, the ELTs will be transformative for transiting exoplanets and for precision radial velocities as well. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to in the next few decades. I think also paying attention to the software and the analysis side of things is important as well, because, you know, again, if regardless of how precise your data is, at some point you need to deal with things like the star causing problems. And so 
concerted efforts where, whether it's you know, funding students or postdocs or like research initiatives out of some institution where folks have the, the time to play with, you know, it's not just I reduce the data and it seems to work and so I'm gonna call that good. Like mm -hmm. let's put the time in to really compare different approaches and see which one works the best and then have like well documented and archived software that other people can you know download and play with and interpret easily because right now it is such a black box like my code included dear lord if anyone tries to run the things i've written i think it would not go well um but so setting a higher standard for how we handle software in the field of astronomy i think is a, a good goal that we should all be working towards and in conversations we had setting up for this panel, I think something we all agreed on was training, like training the next generation of people yeah. in instrumentation and in software is really important. You know, I don't think anybody's like, ah, no, no, fine. Uh, <laughs> I think we all think training is important, but explicitly having that be a recommendation in the 2020, like that it's important to invest in people getting these skills, I think would be useful. And I think cross-training people in skills, going back to the question from earlier of like, what can we learn from other areas is, making a real effort so that people aren't brought up in this you know, very like tunnel vision, I only think about RVs, I only think about transits. Like we should take advantage of knowing that NASA does have a planetary side and that like heliophysics is a thing that we should know more about. And mm -hmm. so start students younger in getting input from you know, more than one set of um, uh, science focuses. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we can take a page out of our physicist colleagues' books when it comes to training um, for instrumentation. Um, any physics program that we see will have many graduate students who are focused on experimental physics. And what they do might have a lot in common with engineering, um, but that doesn't make it any less valuable. In astronomy, at times, we can get very caught up in what is and isn't astronomy, and can a student do a PhD that has more of this engineering focus and still be an astronomer? And I think we need to embrace that diversity because Exoplanet science is an entirely instrumentation-driven field, and we need a lot of smart people to understand the science requirements and to build that next generation of instruments and observatories, and we need to start training them now. So I think that's something we can really improve on in the next few decades. Okay, we have about three and a half minutes left, and so I'm gonna throw you the question that I told you about, <laughs> um, which was kind of closing out the panel. I wanted to know um, from the panelists what they thought uh, the day in the life of an exoplanet astronomer in 2050 would look like. Uh, maybe a good day. <laughs> hmm? Well, we're all pretty young, so I hope in 2050 we're all still colleagues. Um, 2050, so it's a, it's a decadal year, uh, yeah. probably serving on a panel reading one of the 7,000 white papers that have been <laughs> submitted because I'm sure that the field keeps growing and keeps getting bigger. Um, hopefully, you know, reading about JWST's extension for the third time. And <laughs> that's a good day, right? Sure, a good day. <laughs> we can talk about a good day. I hope that we will all be asked to be refereeing papers that are arguing about biosignature detection. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that, actually. <laughs> um. I imagine working with students and telling them how back in my day you had to actually go to the telescope and you know, oh, yeah. run it by yourself because hopefully by this point we have a fleet of automated, let's say, eight to 10 meter class telescopes that are just doing RV science you know, around the world with great longitudinal coverage. So even though it's noon wherever I am, I'm getting data that's just streaming to me from the, my telescopes on the other side of the world. I love how your 10 meter telescopes are automated. Yeah. 2050, that's Did great. 20, 2050. She told me yeah. I could dream big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think, uh, let's thank our panelists for a great discussion. <laughs>